2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, I'm talking about what it means to have a biblical worldview. And the verse 16 reads as follows, all scripture, Old New Testament, is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man and woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you're going to do what God's called you to do, you've got to know what his will is. You've got to know what he wants and desires. And we cannot become eclectic in our theology where we just pick and choose well, I like this, I don't like this, I, I don't believe this, I don't believe that. And there is an attack upon Christianity. It has been. But it seems to me, as I look at history, more so now than ever before, particularly in our nation, which was founded upon biblical principles, 95% of the men who were involved in bringing forth our Constitution and bylaws were men of faith, godly men. And the concept of separation of church and state didn't mean that the church didn't have any part and influence in political matters in the nation. What it meant was we weren't going to have a state church that everyone here in America had to yield and submit to. We want a religious freedom. We wanted the freedom and move of the Holy Spirit that he can deal with any false religion, any vain philosophy, and bring us into the truth of Jesus Christ. Now, a worldview is how a person sees and understands the world they live in. People who don't have a biblical worldview, meaning if you have a biblical worldview, you look at the world and understand how it was formed and how it continues and how God works and moves based upon the revelation and word of God. My worldview is a biblical worldview. It helps me understand my place as a man of God as a father, as a husband, directed by the Word of God. My worldview, based on the Word of God, tells me and defines what marriage is, what a family is, the church, the body of Christ. My worldview explains to me that God is sovereign, that God's in control, that God, we don't embrace deism, which means we believe in God that he started everything and just step back and just let it go. Or being a theistic evolutionist where you say, well, God started it and now he's letting evolution take over. We as believers have a biblical worldview, believe that science and archaeology just substantiates the truth of God's word. They're not at war with one another that a lot of people think. Most Scientists today do not believe in God. Maybe 7%, they say. Majority of them do not. And they're the ones who are providing institutions of higher learning their textbooks and instruction. That's why our young people need to be grounded in the truth, need good Christian apologetics to deal with all the trash that they're going to deal with when their faith comes under attack and they can stand and not in a rebellious disrespectful way but speak the truth in love interesting and i've said this before i'm saying it again to bring us up to date to be on the same page that one thing that we hold to and having a biblical worldview is that the Word of God is infallible. 
Now, what I mean by that, and I put in parentheses my introduction, incapable of making mistakes or being wrong. Amen? Uh, I've had people who spoke to me and said, Ed, that, that book is a bunch of mythology. I said, do you ever read it? Oh, once. Oh, so now you're a, a qualified expert. Now, I'm not trying to be that, maybe that sarcastic. But most people who are criticizing the Bible, and even people in the church, because only 9% of born-again believers have a biblical worldview. 91% do not. And one of their disagreements, they'll say, well, I think the Bible contradicts itself. It's not really infallible. Uh, you know, I can embrace parts of the New Testament. But the Old Testament, forget about that. And that's being preached in a lot of churches, even in the Atlanta area, where they're discarding creationism discarding the old testament you mean to tell me that jonah was swallowed by a great fish ah come on uh, that, that didn't really happen that was just an illustration oh i guess jonah wasn't a real person huh it just may oh yeah maybe he was but the fish you know come on and i don't want to get ugly you can say well maybe you can swim out in the Pacific and I pray for God to have a fish just take you as an appetizer and maybe you'll believe. Some people have to come the hard way. But, you know, I, I think what happens when people even in the church begin to question some of the foundational principles of Christ, Christianity they begin to doubt and question the veracity of the Holy Scriptures, they are in danger of embracing a strong delusion and falling away from the truth. That's why I read through the Bible every year, just not through a, a read crazy, not just saying, well, I read through the Bible, but read it, and sometimes I'll slow down and just meditate and think about what I'm reading. Currently, I'm reading through the book of Job. And read many times. And, and I'm reading about what happened in the life of Job. And then his first response to all that had happened. This guy had his, the rug pulled out from under him. And his first response in dealing with the calamity and the adversity and the attack from Satan upon his life, his family, his fortune, and he was just brought to being in sackcloth and ashes and his skin just covered with boils. And here's what he said. His first response, I wish I'd never been born. I wish the day that I was born that was just wiped out. And we might be critical of him. We might question that. I'd probably be in the same place if I had lost all my children. I lost everything I worked so hard for. I, he had 7,000 camels. I had trouble handling just one. Those things, when they spit on you, it's nasty. It's coming up from their innermost being. Think about 7,000 that's just camels and the oxen. I mean, the list goes on. So you know, I really believe that happened. I really believe he lived. I really believe that God was working and moving his life. And a lot of people would just, even in the church, will say, you know, I disregard that. If you begin to see all Scripture, all Scripture, all the New Testament, is inspired, breathed upon by the Holy Spirit, and is profitable for, for doctrine, principles that we hold fast to. You've got to have, when you say you don't need the Old Testament, when you read Scripture that was quoted in the New Testament, guess what they were quoting? Not the New Testament. It was being compiled. 
yet not canonized. It was referring to the Old Testament. You cannot understand the new without the old. All Scripture. Amen? So, it brings me to this question I asked in point two. How important are the Scriptures to the believer? Old and New Testament. First, the Scriptures grant us wisdom which leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. When you study the Old Testament, when you study the tabernacle of Moses, every artifact, every piece of furniture in there points to Jesus. It makes sense. Table showbread, he's the bread of life. The menorah, he is the light of the world. Amen? The altar of incense, the prayers of the saints, the fragrance of God, the tabernacle, I mean, the holy of holies, the ark of the covenant. It talks about the mercy seat. It talks about inside that little golden box was Aaron Rod that budded. The Ten Commandments talks about the golden pot of manna. It talks about the rebellion of man at the time of the budding, budding of the rod and the manna when they were complaining. I want some meat. I want some meat. I want to go to McDonald's. I want to go to Burger King. I'm tired of eating Captain D's. You see, they complain on all that, yet the mercy of God covered that. The God's mercy covers us. If yeah, I'm in a situation and God, the righteous king, comes to judge me, don't judge me according to the law, God. Judge me, not have mercy upon me. Because if you judge me, I'm going to fall short. So the Old Testament has the law, has those precepts. Jesus comes along in the New Testament. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law. The law points and makes me realize that I'm a sinner and that I need a Savior and points to Christ who comes who's the Redeemer. So I come not to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Amen? We need the balance of law and grace. We need that balance. You take one away, you're imbalanced. You got people who overemphasize grace like a Bible college back in the 70s in Florida emphasized grace over the law and said, you know what? God loves you so much. He wants you to live the life and behave the way you are, and you can be promiscuous, and he'll forgive you. You can take your liberty because in the book of 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter says, we are at liberty in Christ to do whatever we want. But it says, not all things are expedient. You can't take liberty and don't become a stumbling block for someone else. Amen? You've got, you got, you got to look at all Scripture to get a balance. And if you just take the law without grace, you become legalistic. become legalistic and begin to move away from faith and depend upon your legalistic interpretation of Scripture. And if we do that, a lot of people couldn't come into this church. We would be judging based on the outward appearance and not trusting God who looks on the heart of man. So, the Scriptures grant us wisdom which leads us to salvation. The law of God it says the law gives us the knowledge of sins, but we thank God through his grace and faith in Jesus. He can redeem us from all our sins. The scriptures, inspired by God, as I mentioned, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness. What in the world is righteousness? When you become a believer, do you know what happens? God comes and he imparts unto you his righteousness, meaning you're justified by your faith in Christ, which is referred to in Habakkuk and also in the New Testament, that you are right standing with God because of what Jesus has done. When you stand before God, he doesn't see your blemishes. He doesn't see your spots. He doesn't see your imperfections. He sees you as being whole. He's our righteousness. He grants that to your checking account, and you can write a check. 
Amen? In right standing with God. Doesn't mean I'm perfect, but when God looks at me, he looks at you, he doesn't see any junk. He sees you through the eyes of Jesus being complete and whole. Now, yeah, we're in the process of being sanctified, meaning being set apart unto God and growing, and the truth of God's Word will perfect and mature us if we'll give ourselves to it. You know, some people think, I just stand here and God come on down. He's working and moving, but at the same time, he expects us to step up to the plate. He expects us to give ourselves to him. He expects us to walk and be worthy of a servant, of a son of God, a daughter of God, to do what God's called us to do. The scriptures perfect and mature us for the work that God has called us to do. I've been in ministry since the early 70s. And I see God still perfecting me and working in me. He's the clay. I mean, he's the potter. We're the clay. And it, sometimes we misinterpret the dealings of God and think of Satan when God is the one who's squeezing us. God's the one who's putting the pressure. He can use suffering. He can use finances. He can use relationships. He can use a trial or tribulation to conform us, to mold us. When have you grown the most in your faith? When everything was smooth and nice? And when you found yourself between a rock and a hard place? When you were so angry at your spouse that you said, well, I'm not considered divorced, but I do and consider and think about murder. <laughs> or you find yourself so frustrated with that child, the grandchild, that you just want to choke them. You ever been there? God, I need your righteousness. <laughs> I'll look for scriptures in the Bible where God says, even though he was the high priest, God killed his sons. I say, see right there, Lord. <laughs> you know, take them out. <laughs> Can't do that. You know, we want to proof text, you know, and justify things. What about everything you depended upon, your car, your appliances, your house, and everything just goes kaput? They're made by man, a do wear out. God, I can't believe I got to buy new tires. Why? I thought they're going to last forever. Remember, Lord, in the wilderness, their clothes never wore out? They always had food, get water from a rock. How come this not happened in my life? Where's the divine provision? He gives you a good, clear, sound mind. Amen. I don't need to pray, God, do I need to rotate my tires? Do I need to brush my teeth? Don't need to get dressed today. Don't become so spiritually minded that you say, I'll be like Isaiah. He went naked for three and a half years. I don't have to buy any clothes. So we look at the scriptures. We read the scriptures and we gain wisdom. Ask for it. And God will give us wisdom. You want to get out of debt? Stop buying lottery tickets. You know, you, the, the way you do it is God says you earn money the old-fashioned way. You work for it. That's what we're trying to teach our young people. Food does not come from Kroger's. It's called the miracle of the seed falling into the ground. It's amazing. I, I see God in that. I'm not a pantheist, but I see the creator working through his creation and take an ugly seed. I remember the young people looking at what, what that's so ugly, that corn. It was perp, it was pink and it was wrinkled up. I said, we're gonna put that in the soil and we're gonna spit on it and leave it and watch what happens. Corn's that high now. It's only been out there four weeks. That's holy land. I mean, what makes that happen? Now, 
God expects us to get out there to weed it, to cultivate it, to water it when it's not raining and do wise things. But really, you cannot make a seed germinate. You can't, you can't control the weather. We are totally, totally dependent upon God. I get that worldview from my Bible. From my Bible, I put my faith and confidence. I thank God for doctors and nurses, but God's the healer. They can only do so much. Many of you can testify that God is the healer. And a lot of people are naturalists, meaning they don't believe in God and put their faith and confidence solely and totally upon medical technology. But they can't live forever. It's appointed. My Bible tells me in Hebrews. I believe it's in the second chapter. It's appointed unto man wants to die after this, the judgment. People who don't have God, you know what they believe? That's it. I die, I just go back and become fertilizer. Just go back into the earth. There's some truth to that. The body is in the grave or cremated. But the soul and the spirit, according to my biblical worldview, as a believer in Christ Jesus, immediately in the presence of God the Father. And to the last day, those who have died in Christ are resurrected. And that body that was either cremated or lost at sea or buried becomes a glorious body, which is designed as it was from the beginning to live forever. It's connected with the soul and spirit. That's what my Bible tells me. My Bible, my worldview, your worldview gives us hope beyond the grave. Can you say amen? amen? The scriptures will guide and lead us to do God's will. Psalm 119, 105, the word of God is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. He used those metaphors to explain God leading and guiding us. And one of the best methods and ways of knowing the will of God is from his last will and testament. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Because as a young man, God, I want to follow you and pursue after you. So you read God's word, you meditate in God's word, you study God's word. Amen. You pray the word of God. You memorize that word. And you live out that word. The scriptures enlighten us and help us gain revelation and knowledge of the Lord. Ephesians 1, 17. Unless God opens your eyes and ears spiritually, you never see or understand. You see, in the sower of the seed, four types of ground, wayside, stony, thorny, fertile soil. All of them received the word with joy. All of them heard, but the fertile soil was different because not only did they hear the word of God, they understood it. I want understanding. And all you're getting, it says in Proverbs, get understanding. Amen? The Old Testament and the New Testament are both foundational to our faith. Don't let someone tell you otherwise. Some are discarding the Old Testament saying, well, don't let that be a hang-up. If you stumble or trip, just, just focus on the resurrection. Yes, the resurrection is important. Without the resurrection, our faith's in vain. But I need, you need, all Scripture. Amen? Ephesians 2.20 says, here's the foundation. The foundation of our Christian faith is based upon the truth of what the prophet said, Old Testament, and what the apostles said, New Testament. Jesus is the cornerstone. He's the glue who brings it all together. That's the foundation of our Christian faith. You can't exempt one and choose the other. We have to go back to what Paul said to Timothy. All Scripture is profitable. Amen? God's Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I want to read you a story in closing. 
about how precious the Word of God. One of the most persecuted places on the face of the earth to be a Christian is what nation do you think? North Korea. To be a believer at North Korea will cost you your life, really. There's a young man. His name was Chin May. He was a border guard in North Korea. And to survive, even though he was a border guard in the army of North Korea, he smuggled things from outside of North Korea, from China primarily, into North Korea to survive. And if you get caught smuggling, it's a serious offense. So let me just read this to you, then we'll close. Just be patient. When another guard reported that Chin Mei's smuggling ring, this guard was found out he spent 60 torturous days in prison. He hadn't even smuggled the most dangerous item in the country. Guess what the most dangerous item to smuggle in the North Korea? The Bible. There's so many people in the church and in America take it for granted. You could probably go into the homes of some believers if they call them and blow the dust off. Open it up and it looks like it never been opened before. God forgive us. God forgive us. Those who let Bibles in the North Korea had a more severe punishment than someone who kills people. You see, the Word of God is a threat. The Sing Jung theology. Sing Jung theology is socialism based upon Marxism and Leninism that the founders these leaders, Kim Jong-un and his family, started 70 years ago by his grandfather and his father, now this young man. And it's socialism, but not communism. See, communism is socialism that denies the existence of God. But they, the difference in North Korea with this Sung Jung theology is that Kim Jong-un is deity. He's a god. And people are required to worship Kim Jong-un and his forefathers. So if you bring in a Bible, that's an attack upon their theology or their belief system, their worldview. For Chen Mei, getting caught smuggling meant being reduced from a respected soldier to a worthless prisoner. For 10 days, he was forced to stand in a bowing position and was allowed to move only to use the restroom. If he moved, even during the night, he was beaten mercifully with a wooden baton. For the next 50 days, he was forced to remain in a position of his choosing but he said every sitting for 24 hours straight became very uncomfortable. Sometimes, as time went on, it was more comfortable to be beaten, he said. Now, this is not just an ordinary citizen. This is a border guard. Despite the punishment he suffered, Chin Mei returned to smuggling as soon as he returned to work. Financially, he had no other choice. One day, Chen Mei agreed to help a woman from his village smuggle a shipment of DVD players into North Korea, knowing he could make, make money in this deal, much money. When the woman arrived at, the, at his post with 30 boxes, Chen Mei opened a random box to give the appearance of inspecting the shipment. But the box he opened happened to also contain six Bibles. Suddenly, his heart filled with fear. Although he had never seen a Bible before, he had been taught that they were subversive to Sinche, the North Korean religion that requires worship and subservience to the Kim family. He was torn about what to do. He finally decided to let the Bibles pass. 
We didn't see anything that day, he told his friend. You and I will keep the secret until we die. North Korean border guards must follow a strict protocol when they seize one or more Bibles. They are forbidden from opening a Bible and, much, and must report them to their superiors before enduring 10 days of interrogation. Chin Mei knew guards who had been through the process, and he also knew that he could be killed if another guard had seen the Bibles and reported him for allowing this entry. They know that the Bible is the enemy. He said of the North Korean border guards, it's something that they choose to avoid at all times. I wouldn't even dare to open it because of my Sinche ideology. Now what happened to this young man was God began to move in his life and stir him. And he finally escaped to China and eventually made his way to South Korea. And when he was in South Korea, he met a Christian, and the Christian asked him what he believed. He said, I don't believe in God. And this young Christian man gave him some literature, gave him a Bible, and he started reading that Bible and that literature about what it meant to be a follower of Christ and he gave his heart and life to Jesus. He said, I know the only way I could survive, even in South Korea, was to stick to God. He said, just grab him wherever he goes, meaning grab a hold of God. I kept that in my mind, and whenever I read the Bible, I didn't read it like any other book. I read it and took every word of the Bible into my heart. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and instruction in righteousness. So you see how valuable it is, the Word of God, to people who are being persecuted and could lose their life for just reading a Bible or possessing a Bible. And my heart grieves because 91%, according to a Barna Research Group in America, do not have a biblical worldview. You know why? Because biblically, I think a lot of people, even in the church, not outside the church, are illiterate. We need to say, God, I thank you that you have given me your holy word. And that Jesus said, And it was spoken of in the Gospel of John. It talks about the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus and His Word, that's the truth. Amen? Amen. That's the truth. And we need to cherish that. We need to realize that this brings us into a personal, intimate relationship with God Almighty. And when We look at God's Word. We're not saying that this necessarily is magical, but when we read the Word of God, the Holy Ghost takes it and He enlightens it, and we begin to hear and know God and draw close to Him. Do you want that? To draw closer? Have you exhausted the Bible? I haven't. I'm going to continue reading this and asking God to speak to me until the day I take my last breath. And then when we see him as he is, we'll know him and see him. And all the questions we have about this one or that one, when we stand in his presence, he'll enlighten our mind, and instead of using 10% of our brain, we'll use probably 100%, and we'll know and see as he, the teacher, teaches us. Will you please stand?